For the kids, for the young players, it is not okay to help with a wild card, the player that was banned for doping. It is not about Maria Sharapova here, but it is about all the players that are found doped. I can't control God. It's a risk you take, you know? I can't control the wind yeah. or God. So then, if, then I will call out the tour director. But I'm just saying that if the wind blows, there's nothing I can do about that. I can't control God. Talk to him. Doped, duped, which Duped, is it? Gagged. Welcome to the body, sir. <laughs> Welcome back. Because if you weren't a doper and doped, then in this case you were duped. I'm already confused. What you, <laughs> you? I was playing, mm -hmm. doing a word thing there. You got it. I got it. Okay. We're supposed to introduce ourselves, or we always do. I'm James. I'm Jonathan. Welcome back to the body, sir. Episode number three thirty six. That cold open was obviously Simona Halep. Was in, it obvious? Well, for some. In 2017, after Maria Sharapova got a wild card into the Stuttgart tournament, which was actually beginning during her doping suspension. But as soon as her doping suspension was reduced, she was allowed to enter that tournament, essentially the moment it expired. The reason why we're talking about this is because the decision from Cass, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, was rendered March 5th, and Simona Halep is now able to play tennis again. In fact, she'll be back in Miami. Her suspension was reduced from four years to nine months. Having not played tennis since the US Open in 2022, that time has been deemed to have been served, and she's back. The suspension will have officially expired on July 6th, 2023. This is long past time served, and she may now return to tennis whenever she'd like. She has gotten a wild card into Miami. We will compare this to the Sharapova situation in a moment, but just want to get the details out of the way. The CEAS panel determined, on the balance of probabilities, that the rule violation was not intentional. And they accepted the argument in the appeal that the drug came from a contaminated supplement. Uh, let's remember uh, what balance of probabilities means and what are the various burdens of proof there are in these types of cases. No party has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. That is a, a criminal level. They're not being held to that standard. A player must prove on a balance of probabilities that they didn't do this thing. And that basically means, is it more or less likely that this is true? And the accuser, which is the anti-doping authority or the sports governing body, they must be, quote, comfortably satisfied, which is a higher standard than balance of probabilities, but less than beyond a reasonable doubt. In this press release, they gave us only two pages. It was really just the meat and potatoes of the... No. No. The meat and potatoes no. is like the no. heft. Right. It's, a, it's a synopsis. It's a screenshot yes. of what's to come. Meat and potatoes is like the, the fine details. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Not that. Okay, yeah. It's kind of like peruse actually means to actually dive into something in detail, but we use it as, as meaning to scan. Who is we? People. Oh. Anyway, they gave us two pages. The full decision will be out later at an undetermined date, probably two minutes after we finish recording, based on our recent timing. What we know is that Cass feels that Simona bears some fault, but there is, quote, no significant fault or negligence. You may remember this from Cass's ruling on the Sharapova appeal. They found her also having no significant fault or negligence. That was a wild time. I remember to Oof. this day exactly where I was when Sharapova announced her suspension. Oh, me too. I was on the subway coming home from school. I was at Square One Mall in Mississauga, and I was running <laughs> what errands is that on pre-renovations, my... pre right? I don't know. Maybe the last time I've been there, I it was a, a specific time that the press press conference was happening, and so I made sure to stop what I was doing and be seated in the in a little bench. Mm in a quiet area of the mall while the news came out. Oh, could you actually stream it or you're just looking at like the news? I was looking at updates. Oh, okay. 
it was a wild time. In this case, the independent tribunal, which we talked about in depth a few months ago, they conceded that there could have been contamination in this supplement, this keto MCT supplement, but there was disagreement. The doctor from WADA, Dr. Chris Eichner, didn't think there was contamination at all. And Simona's team presented alternative science from this doctor named Dr. Alvarez, which showed that there could have been contamination in the supplement. And that was really their their best case, right? To argue that the supplement companies are reckless and there's often cross-contamination in their products. And Howard Jacobs noted today to John Wertheim that he has sued a lot of supplement companies and won on this basis. As for the blood doping charge, the blood passport charge, Cass says, quote, The CAS panel determined that it was appropriate in the circumstances to consider the results of a private blood sample given by Miss Halep on September 9th, 2022, in the context of a surgery which occurred shortly thereafter. Those results and Miss Halep's public statements that she did not intend to compete for the remainder of the 2022 calendar year impacted the plausibility of the doping scenarios relied upon by the ITF Independent Tribunal. And now this is so starkly different from what the ITIA and the Independent Tribunal ruled. The tribunal concluded that the biological passports were showing, quote, illicit blood manipulation, which is a truly damning charge and something that would end your career at this age. That was the charge. And remember, it was an additional charge to what was made public initially. Yes. Right? That was the charge that had us and a lot of folks really trying to grapple with how can we find innocence here in this story. Even if there's negligence, even if there's a a want to believe inadvertent contamination with the Ruxatostat, Mm -hmm. right? Because that was very plausible at the start, right? right? But then when you tack on the blood doping, it becomes a whole nother scenario for help. Mm-hmm. The independent tribunal had pages and pages of evidence, but us as non-experts never really knew. I, I mean, we couldn't judge whether or not the evidence showed what they claimed it showed. What's confusing to me here is that they mentioned this very quickly in the press release. It didn't really explain much, and we know that no new evidence had been presented through the appeal. How did they come to such different conclusions? Howard Jacobs, who is Simona's lawyer, said that the biological passport evidence was extremely implausible. He felt it was trumped up and didn't really think that it would hold up on appeal. It did not hold up on appeal, but we don't know why. Right? We've only seen a little bit of why the CAS panel made this decision. They said a big part of it was the context, that Simona was getting a surgery in September and then she did not plan to play the rest of the year, so why would she be blood doping? As a lay people, I don't know. But like, uh, as a context, is that good enough to throw out the whole case? That's what I want to see from the decision, right? Did they kind of examine the science deeply and say, this is not pointing to what you said it's pointing to. And we've seen just from the hearings themselves that you can get two scientists to interpret results in different ways. Right. It seems that although science has a reputation, rightly so, of being irrefutable, the data still relies on interpretation. Right. And each side has experts. And this is not me calling into question the integrity of those experts. It's just that they've made different conclusions based on their expertise. And you're also not going to present evidence from a scientist who totally refutes your case. mm -hmm. (laughs) Right? I think the takeaway here is, yet again, there are questions of the doping control processes. Because why repeatedly do athletes get handed these bans and time and again, especially in tennis they get reduced significantly upon appeal. What is what is missing here? Mm-hmm. How is it that time and again, CAS comes to such wildly different conclusions to the ITIA, to WADA? Who is doing things incorrectly here? Yeah, so th- that's one of the biggest questions. And 
this whole process will and already has eroded trust really deeply in tennis's anti-doping processes. In CAS, I have no idea. But generally how it works is that the sporting authorities have their own anti-doping authorities. Recently, tennis moved it at an arm's length to the ITIA rather than the ITF. Right? The ITF used to administer the anti-doping program. They don't anymore. Now an independent body does. They make the first ruling. If it's appealed, it goes to an independent tribunal. And then athletes can appeal to the Court of Arbitration for Sport, which is in Switzerland. It was founded originally as part of the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, and it was intended to be their kind of anti-doping arbitration court. You can actually appeal the CAS up to Swiss federal courts of appeals, but they only rule on matters of procedure, Mm. not the content. As part of this judgment, the ITIA must now pay Hal up 20,000 Swiss francs for her legal fees. That, that, I did laugh when I saw that. Because that was like, oh, just uh, we thought your case was so crappy that you've wasted everybody's time. Now, you brought up this interesting question about, well, first of all, why are the rulings so different? And they have been in a number of tennis cases. Yastremska, Irani, Sharapova... Uh, Mariano Puerta, way back in, I think, 06, like, suspensions are routinely getting reduced for tennis players. And in a lot of these cases, it's without the introduction of new evidence. Right. Uh, My question from this is, is the CAS trying to influence policy in these sporting organizations? Like, does this group of arbitrators think that the sports governing bodies are being draconian in these suspensions they're handing out? And so this is a part of the outstanding questions that we have in the wake of this news. Something else that we wondered and wanted to know, and Howard Jacobs answered that in his interview with John Wortham today, we wanted to know why didn't Simona list the keto supplement on her doping control form, and that would have been September 2022, and why didn't she mention it in her October 2022 interview with ITIA? The Independent Tribunal Report called it, quote, distinctly careless. Now, Howard Jacobs says that Simona actually did mention it and list it on the form. However, in a way, it was listed as Shinusa recovery drink. Shinusa being the company that manufactures those pills headquartered in Canada. And apparently there was this recovery drink that she was being administered by the folks at Patrick's Academy that contained two supplements blended together into this recovery drink. And so allegedly, according to Mr. Jacob, Simona declared Shinusa recovery drink, presumably that being the best of her knowledge of what she was taking. To me, I would agree with the tribunal's assessment that this was distinctly careless, even though she she did list something. But what she did list, it implies to me that she didn't know exactly what was in it, that her team was giving her a supplement that they ensured was safe, and she took it. Did they even assure her it was safe? Or well, we all, don't all parties were just going into this blindly? Right. Jacob said in that interview that one of the things that can influence the, the arbitration court's ruling is, okay, so the athlete took uh, a supplement that had a banned substance in it. Did she take pains to consult experts and make sure that the supplement was safe to the best of their knowledge? In my view, she did not do that. But the court still reduced the, spe- the suspension. They were confident that the doping was not intentional. Who bears the blame here? Well, under the rules, only the player. But if we're looking at, you know, ethically, who bears the blame? There might be a little bit of blame to go around. But I'm reminded of, I, you know, I'm watching Real Housewives of Beverly Hills oh. season 11 right now. Is this Erica Jane? It's the fir- yes, the first time I've seen it. Erica Girardi whose husband, Tom Girardi, has now been disbarred, was accused of funneling tens of millions of dollars into Erica's business. She claimed she had no idea. Sometimes I believe her. And to me, she was distinctly careless. She saw money coming in and she didn't really question where it was from. This is clearly on a different level. I'm not saying that she and Simona are the same, but Simona trusted these folks to get safe, supplements and vitamins and all that stuff for her. That's what the team was supposed to do. And she trusted them. 
and she probably should not have trusted them. Is it more similar to Maria Sharapova? Let's talk about that. So going back to our cold open, Simona was critical of Maria when she came back, especially the decision of many tournaments to give her wild cards as she built her ranking back up. And now she sits in the same position of having to have her hand out for a wild card. Yes. Their situations are not dissimilar. They're not the same, but and there are a number of similarities. I've seen a lot of fighting on the internet with some folks saying she did share Pova dirty and now look at her. And people saying, well, these are not the same at all. How dare you? <laughs> but there are similarities. They are. The, the gag is Simone was accused of something much, much more serious than what Sharapova was. What Sharapova did, to, to remind folks, or if you don't know, she was taking a drug called meldonium mm -hmm. in early part of 2016. Yes, 2016. It had been added to the banned substance list on January 1st of 2016. Memos went out in the back half of 2015 saying, hey, as of this date, can't be doing that anymore. She was negligent. In not reading her emails, mm -hmm. allegedly. Blamed her agent. Max. M Max Eisenbud. Who made her rich, like Lena. <laughs> yeah. That's how that played out. So she so, was taking a supplement or a drug that was legal up until the couple of weeks that it wasn't where she was tested and found to have taken it. Right. She had been taking this, this drug for years. She had, like Simona neglected to put it on her doping control form, which was a red flag at the time. I mean, we roasted Maria. Mm -hmm. we, were n we were not kind, perhaps not even fair, looking back. Uh, I, I do not want to go back and listen to that. <laughs> no. And the other similarity, of course, is that they were both found to have no significant fault or negligence for their anti-doping rule violation. Maria Sharapova's suspension was reduced from two years to 15 months, I believe. So quite a bit longer than Simona's. It started at only two years. Simona started at four years, four years concurrent suspensions for two major violations, and then reduced to nine months. It's a huge reduction. So the Roxatistat sentence was longer on its own than the comparable Meldonium suspension. Yes. I think people are delighting in this Simona quote because... Of course, it exposes hypocrisy, but I think it exposes hypocrisy in all of us. It shows you an athlete who feels she's just been exonerated behaving like tennis Twitter, mm -hmm. behaving like a human, right? She wouldn't hold herself to those standards that she held tournaments and Sharapova to at the time because she's like, I didn't do this. But Maria also was saying... I didn't do this on purpose. Mm -hmm. Like there's the situations are not that not that different. Simona herself should be saying I didn't do this on purpose because she mm -hmm. did do it. Because she did do it. She of did course. do it. Now what it also shows me is just how much we hold people to different standards based on whether we like them or not. Mm -hmm. And what was clear is that a lot of people, and we were probably guilty of this as well, held Maria to a different standard than they did with Simona this time because they, we, didn't like her. Exactly. And the players who criticized Sharapova back then, Bouchard, Cornet, Halep in her way, not nearly as harshly as the others, there were a number of players. And then, I mean, Eisenbud got involved and called Radvanska and Wojniacki uh, journeywoman players. It was ugly all around. But they hated her ass. They didn't like her. The, you know, that contributed to a lot of the way that they didn't welcome Maria back into the sport. And with Simona, she, she started as a well-liked, trusted athlete, and she'll remain that way. You know, you have Chris Everett saying, I knew she was innocent, which by the letter of the law is untrue. All of the most powerful people in tennis stood behind her during this. And it's just, it's interesting to me that Maria Sharapova made them a shitload of money, but a lot of people didn't stand behind her. And I'm not saying woe is Maria, because a lot of people also did, you know, said she's no way she did this. But a lot of her fellow players just do not like her. Mm -hmm. And to me, that just, it is a little bit refreshing to see that players are also human and players are like us in that we are hypocritical and 
we make these judgments about people because of our personal feelings. I would also like to have someone ask Simona directly about this, her stance then versus what she's now asking for from tournaments coming back from this situation and see if she has anything new to offer, if she thinks any differently. Make no mistake, the reason why people view Simona differently as opposed to what they felt about Maria, if you are one of those people who views it as two different things, it's because you've decided that Simona is innocent, in fact, infected with integrity, and Maria was guilty and lacking integrity and unscrupulous. Right. Maria was this cold and calculating woman. And Simona, you know, there is always this element in the way people talk about Simona is that, yeah, of course, like she has integrity, she's a great sports person, but also, is she even capable of such a thing? And I said it on the last episode, there was a lot of infantilizing Simona in the way it's talked about that she, no, she couldn't do this. She is a grown woman, right? She makes her own decisions. And so we blamed, not we, but the sport blamed Patrick. They blamed the team. I mean, under the rules, the player is the, the only party that bears the burden here. That and should I don't, change. I don't, right. I don't know that that's necessarily fair, but a lot of prominent people in tennis wanted the player to bear no blame. Mm-hmm. Right. There has to be something in the middle. And Simona wants us to feel, and she's carrying on this victory tour, that she should bear no blame, that she's completely innocent. And I reject that. She's not completely innocent. Was right. she untreated she's, unfairly? She... We'll see what the full decision is when it comes out. Probably. Maybe so. Mm-hmm. I think we can say unequivocally that the the way this process unfolded was entirely too long mm-hmm. and cast a lot of doubt on the system itself. If an athlete has already served, what, practically 18 months of a ban that you reduced to nine months, that took too long. But you cannot say that I am 100% innocent because that's just not true. Those are not the, the rules under which the sport operates. Right. You, you were found with a banned substance in your bloodstream, in your urine. What I'm curious about when the decision comes out is, first of all, how did they determine on a balance of probabilities that the ingestion of Roxadustat was unintentional? That's interesting to me because the ITIA was so firm on that. The, you know, they thought that they could prove that it was definitely intentional. Now, was it definitely intentional that Maria Sharapova took meldonium? Why would an athlete take meldonium when you've been notified that it is illegal? <laughs> right. That doesn't make any and it sense. Was, she was taking it intentionally, but she, I guess, unintentionally broke the rules, which right. again is... <laughs> <laughs> uh, ignorance of the rules isn't... a. Uh, an excuse, but again, this is not a court of law, right? They have a lot of leeway here. I'm also interested in, like, what is the, at this stage, what is the mandate of the CAS? They were initially established to oversee Olympic sports. They've now been pushed at sort of an arm's length. There's a separate organization that runs the CAS, so it's not actually part of the IOC. I guess why is the CAS the prevailing body of arbitrators for all sports around the world. And are they, again, I'll ask, like, are they trying to influence policy among sporting governing bodies by saying these suspensions are ridiculous? Maybe you're not finding the real dopers. In some Olympic sports, there's a perception that CAS is corrupt and that they're inconsistent. Around half of the CAS arbitrators also hold positions in sporting governing bodies And the IOC president, Thomas Bach, criticized Cass harshly in 2018 when they overturned the sanctions against 28 Russian athletes. So with any institution, I just wonder, who are the arbitrators? Why do they get chosen? What is, is the purpose of the CAS only to arbitrate ongoing cases? Or are they trying to influence doping policy? On a more macro level, this and the way it played out showed, again, just how inherently unfair anti-doping is. Because if you don't have the means and the money to defend yourself through multiple hearings at multiple levels, to sustain yourself while you're just sitting by the wayside waiting for this to unfold, to continue to pay a coach, to continue to be able to afford to train, if you don't have those resources to be able to get these reduced 
suspensions that CAS routinely delivers, the track record is there now. Right. What about the players who don't have those means? Mikhail Emer, for example. Does he not have the means or was there just no movement at all? Was there no budging on his suspension? Which... Or maybe he just didn't have the desire. He was like, right, F this, I'm out. Right. And, you know, he's had pretty public skirmishes with very important Swedish sporting officials. Does not have a good relationship with his federation, it seems. He went nuclear this week. I don't know if you saw, he tweeted a bunch of things and then deleted the whole account. I did not. Yeah. Making accusations against certain members of the Swedish sporting bodies the the stark contrast i think to the from the emer case to uh say yastremska or chilich uh, who troitsky right all of these people got reduced suspensions and howard jacobs when asked why do you think tennis keeps getting mm-hmm. ba- basically why are tennis players successful at court and in tennis in particular if we have this anti-doping policy the system set up to catch dopers but routinely we have the athletes who are supposedly caught almost all being deemed to have done it unintentionally. What are we doing here? I guess is my question. Just briefly, Jacobs did say they probably can afford legal counsel, which is the reason they're they're successful. He conceded, like, I imagine he's expensive, right? He yeah, is like, he's like the, best the, in the business. most important lawyer in this area in the world. He probably costs a lot of money. And he knows that only certain players can afford to defend themselves for that long. But if all of these people have stories that we accept, where are the actual dopers? If Irani ate tampered with tortellini, Yastremska was doped up through sexual contact. Marin Cilic took the glucose by accident. The Colombian beef, which I actually do buy that story. Um, <laughs> but... We accept all these stories, and they may be plausible. Why aren't you catching the actual dopers? Where are they? Are the dopers the people who are allegedly gaming the system for amphetamines? Is that worse than a contamination, an unintentional contamination? Mm -hmm. These are the gray areas that we must live with under this system. Totally. The accusation is that all of the real doping happens under therapeutic use exemptions. Right, players present allegedly bogus diagnoses and they're allowed to take these medications. Now, I don't really have a dog in this fight. I don't have an opinion because I don't know these people's private medical histories, but fellow players make those accusations. But we know also the lessons from other sports are that very wealthy and successful athletes, they can afford to stay ahead of anti-doping. Uh, a number of people who have never been caught, who I won't name. Uh, <laughs> no, but really. The anti-doping authorities are always trying to catch up. Yeah. You have here noted that there was some weird behavior by some journalists. And you ask, are they sensing the tides changing in this sport? You claim, you're not going to get specific, but that there was some offbeat and quote, sort of simping opinions being shared. I can't believe you're quoting me from our agenda. You wrote that on the agenda. quote. (laughs) Yes. So I'm quoting it. Yeah. No, there are very, very few tennis journalists in the United States anymore. As we know, like almost none. What is the weird behavior? The weird behavior is I have read more than one story of this case that looked as if it had been written by Howard Jacobs or used only Howard Jacobs as the source, a one a one source story. Now, this is journalism 101. This is just good journalism, right? Or I mean, this is bad journalism, but there has been some weird, I guess, weird hot takes from some people who were previously rather cautious in the way that they ran their social media. And it feels just a little bit um, like unsavory that journalists should be resorting to that type of behavior. And so I wonder, somebody asked me this, like, do you think they sense the winds changing in tennis? That everything feels just a slight bit sleazy in the past year or so. What is the change? Well, the change is betting, the Saudi deal, Tennis Channel featuring... <laughs> Let me stop on Tennis Channel. So the argument here is that all these things are becoming so permissive and pervasive in the sport that why even bother feign objectivity? Right, well, why bother doing journalism? Mr. Patrick, he's <laughs> out here 
railing against the, quote, unfairness of the process, sir, it is probably best for you to sit this one out and hope that the laws that govern the sport and anti-doping do not change, and even more so that they are not applied retroactively. No, he knows that he's grandfathered in here. He's, he's free and clear on this one. But him talking about unfairness is cute. And then we have the PTPA, who seems to have quite the knack of taking credit for things when they happen without showing the actual work that they did in aiding said results. Right. They want to counsel the ITIA on how to basically remake the whole anti-doping process. I just, again, I don't really know what the PTPA's role in tennis is. Will they become a genuine player association? I always try to remember that they are funded by a billionaire, Bill Ackman, who, while he loves tennis, is also up to, like, other nefarious things in the world, if you've been paying attention. Because tennis does need something like the PTPA. Tennis players need yes. something like the PTPA. But but better. And I, I think there are a lot of legal issues standing in the way of a genuine bargaining unit, like a union. I still would just like to see more tangible work rather than PR bluster, which I think is what's been made public to us by the actual PTPA so far. That's right. all we have to go on. And maybe we just need to wait. Even maybe, longer. No, I mean, maybe it just takes time. Yeah. It would... If the PTA were to be successful... PTPA. It, what did I say? PTA. And the, the parent-teacher associate. If they were to be successful, it would mark a fundamental shift in tennis. We're, we're good with Simona right now? I, I think I've said all I wanted to say. Yeah, I mean, just the disclaimer that this is not our definitive take, because we don't have all the access to the findings. Right. There's still more to come. Better believe... I will be stealing time at work when that decision comes out and reading it in full. Which will maybe change our positions to be more unequivocal one way or the other. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. But as of right now, we are fence-sitters because uh, there is ambiguity. I as think, Meryl said. What did she say? I have doubt. <laughs> I Great love, doubt. I love that movie. About this whole process. Uh, yeah. Nobody is 100% innocent here. I think that's the one thing that I'm willing to take from this unequivocally mm. at this point. Nobody is 100% innocent. So I understand why Simona wants to go on this victory tour. If I'm her, truthfully, if I'm her, I am elated. Oh, of course. I would be... No, I'm saying if I were actually Simona Halep, oh. my response would be, I am so happy. I am so elated. I'm going to keep my mouth shut get back to work, mm -hmm. and not do all this. The infected with integrity right. thing, like, that's not it. I mean, that objectively, scientifically, is corny as fuck. <laughs> that's just a universal truth. She thought um, she ate with that uh, one. She did. But yeah, I would be like, thank you, y'all suck, but I'm going back to work because I don't want to make myself a target again. But I think, like, the players' responses, the players have been absolutely shitting on the anti-doping process throughout this whole thing mm -hmm. and it is in their best interest to kind of shake the table yeah and to undermine the process as the much process, as possible right? absolutely yeah. i think that is one of the things in tennis that has shifted most since the sharapova the most famous mm. doping incident in tennis in yeah. our lifetimes like, the thing that shifted most is just how much players are willing to undermine the process publicly yeah, and I know, I'm sorry, I always go back to athletics, but can you imagine, can you imagine Shelly Ann fraser Bryce or Usain Bolt or anybody saying, the, the doping process is so stupid, it's unreliable, and they're all liars. That would never happen. It couldn't happen. But what's different for me with track, at least the Jamaican situation, than with tennis, the Jamaican association is the one who administers the anti-doping stuff. Tennis has mm. put that off onto somebody else. Right. So Shelly still has to deal with her own association when it comes to how these doping things play out. And it's maybe one of the big differences in tennis now is that you're not speaking out against the ATP or the WTA for their handling of anti-doping mm. or their relationship to the ITF. You feel like there's more distance, right? immediate distance from you. And so you can speak about it more. And it's this mysterious organization. Exactly. Yeah. I know a lot of folks wanted a more timely response to this story. 
you even said to me that I don't so think like, we can wait till next week. Like, we uh, need to, we to record. And I said to you, sir, this is this is going to wait. Like this <laughs> is you you put yourself through that trouble of recording right away and then new information comes out you look stupid you haven't thought about it enough we have never been a breaking news podcast i don't even think podcasts are the right form for breaking news so it's just not something that we've really done mm. so we waited a week and we still have more to talk about mm-hmm. at some point so there there we go now watch watch the uh, decision come out tomorrow and ruin mm. all this anyway we are in tennis paradise. That's where we are currently on the tennis schedule. And you are legally required to say that. Well, I tweeted a couple of days ago that if we actually get Wozniacki and Kerber against each other in the round of 16, and also Naomi versus Coco, then maybe tr- well and truly this is tennis paradise. If they can orchestrate that and make it happen, <laughs> then I'm I'm willing to consider mm-hmm. it. That did not happen because the last leg to complete that foursome didn't get through today we started recording with naomi down a set and a break to mertens and she lost that match at times looking really good Mm -hmm. some of those high kicking backhand winners those mofis backhands like she was down love three in the first set very a, a point away from going down for love gets it back gets it all the way to what it was seven five eventually Uh uh-huh And here and there, she looked really, really excellent Mm -hmm. off the ground. The first serve was MIA pretty much the entire match. At one point, she was making 33% of first serves or something like that. But when she was getting them in, she was winning 90% of them. Mm. It... uh, (laughs) I can't imagine how frustrating it is to play Elisa Mertens (laughs) when she's (laughs) retrieving like that. Yeah. Rafa pulled out of Indian Wells. This was after he showed up for that exhibition in Las Vegas, playing Carlos Alcaraz, losing in that third set super tiebreak. We said on air that he looked a little bit rusty. Slow. Yeah. Um, And as it turns out, he says that he's not physically ready to come back yet. And so in hindsight, it seemed that he was well enough to fulfill that contract in a lower stakes <laughs> match, but not well enough to come back to tour to face that draw that he had. Yeah. He still appears to be in Southern California practicing on clay. So I assume that means we can rule Miami out, unfortunately, for us. Defending champion Rybakina withdrew with illness, and Vondrosheva withdrew as well. Also, a number of singles players who entered the doubles draw pulled out uh, after the draw was made, Mm. which really sucks for the doubles teams that did not make it in. We saw the return of Venus Williams, who looked great for a set and a half. She was up 6-2, unserve 3-2 against now Ibino, and proceeded to lose the last 10 games of that match. In some spots, hitting massive first serves. Retrieving, playing well from the ground for a set and a half. And then she lost that 3-2 game from 40 love up. And then it was just all downhill after that. Venus is 43 years old. She's on the cusp of 44 years old. She looked fabulous in that kit. Yeah, she did. One of the better ones of the past few years, definitely. On the other side of things, Yannick Sinner opens... This 2024 season with 14 straight wins and counting. He has not lost this year. This is a win streak that extends back to Davis Cup at the end of last year. Uh, 17 matches in a row he's won. And since the U.S. Open, he has only lost twice. He's done it the hard way. He beat Novak Djokovic in Australia. There are zero asterisks to this streak. It's just, it's pretty impressive to watch. For much of last year, especially the tail end of last year, I droned on about how I'll believe it when I see it in best of five, and we saw it, Mm -hmm. and the wins still keep coming elsewhere. So I think it's safe to say that Yannick Sinner has arrived. Yannick Sinner is here, and the rest of the girlies should be concerned. (laughs) The big story so far of this tournament, to my mind, is... 
the play of Angelique Kerber and Caroline Wozniacki in getting to the round of 16 to play against each other. Now, while that sounds salivating, while that's... <laughs> oh, the face I just made when you said salivating. No, I, I'm There's here for it. I want to watch it. I no, want to watch it. I don't disagree. I'm just saying the word that you chose was okay. weird to me. Was it moist? It gave me the ick. <laughs> like how people feel about the word moist? Is that where a similar thing? I guess so, yeah. Okay. I don't mind moist, though. Oh, moist you don't? Moist is fine. Yeah. Oh, you are in the minority. It's so cliche. Why does everyone pick the same oh, word? You're like, I actually have a unique word that grosses me out. <laughs> Y'all are basic That's bitches. That's so me. That's so me coded. Uh, but we may not get this match. Or we may not get this match with uh, both women in fine physical fettle. Because... Would oh, you like that alliteration? Fettle. Fettle. <laughs> because... Diego Barbiani told us today that Caroline was seen limping into the site today, that she was being escorted by her husband with a notable limp, and that calls into question her readiness and availability for this round of 16 match. Yeah, so not happy to hear that. How they got here is that Caroline beat Julien first, then the number 25 seed, Donna Vekic, in straights. Then Volanets in three. Volanets who had knocked out both Mira Andreva and Anshapur. Bageling Volanets in that third set. Yep. Kerber, for her part, she beats number 10, Ostapenko, in round two. Then number 17, Kudermatova, in straight sets. And why this is notable, first of all, for several reasons. Both women are coming back from a maternity leave. Kerber's ranked 607, Wozniacki is ranked 204, and both women had only won one match each this entire year, up until Indian Wells. It's the type of result, with one of them going at least a round further to the quarterfinals, you make this return to tour and you make the quarterfinals of a WTA 1000 with wins over top 25 players... And convincing wins at that. These are not easy to come by for anybody in this WTA economy. Mm -hmm. Unless you're Igor Sviantek. Hell, even Arena Sabalenka is out here fighting for her life in this tournament. Mm -hmm. Igor Sviantek, who has won more than 10% of sets in a bagel? I'm stunned. <laughs> I mean, that that stat needs to be shouted from the rooftops. That is terrifying. Gail Monfils today continues his mm -hmm. good form, beats Cam Nori in three sets, making a big comeback in that match. Sabalenka puts in what some people are calling the match of the year, and then won in straight sets over Emma Raducanu today. Kasper is continuing his winning ways. If you recall, he's coming off back-to-back -back finals, mm -hmm. final losses. He gets past Archu Fis 6-2-6-4 today. Holger is winning again, beating Musetti. Oh, this one is notable. Sloane Stevens had Dasha on the ropes. And Kazakino pulled through in three sets. Another heartbreaker for Miss Stevens. Mm -hmm. She previously had a 4-1 head-to-head against Kazakino. Mm. Interestingly, Dasha has beaten her twice at the same place in the same round. Indian Wells' third round. Coco Goff hasn't looked great, but she's still here. Still fighting. And that's uh, what matters right now. Says she's not at all pleased or proud of her game so far, <laughs> but she's pleased as punch with her fight. <laughs> her th third set record is pretty imperious compared to her peers. There's always controversy. Uh, some people are saying that the Indian Wells court is faster this year. Some people say it's super slow. And you don't know who to ask because the players disagree. You're getting <laughs> different stories from everybody. So I don't know. Raducanu made the third round, pushing Sabalenka in two tight sets, losing 3-6-5-7. This after beating Masarova in the first round and getting a walkover, well, a retirement at that point. She was up 4-love against Yastremska in the second round. Lots more tennis to come from Indian Wells, which we'll recap. I, well, I guess you said we're basically weekly at this point. It is, it's been a grind. Oh, I got other jobs. I know. I don't know when the next recording is going to 
B because oh, right. we've got travel plans next week for being in Miami. We're going to get there at different times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm trying to work around my, my work schedule, but I will be there for five days. Yeah, so I don't know if we... We may have to record before the tournament's over. We may have to record Saturday night. Mm. Well, we'll figure it out. We'll see what the agenda is like. Maybe it can wait until we're both on the ground in Miami and we get uh, week two of Indian Wells along with the first few days of Miami kind of thing. Mm-hmm. A few more stories from the week outside of Indian Wells. One of them is that Breakpoint, Netflix's tennis docuseries, has been canceled after their six-episode season two. Could it be that they didn't focus on the right players? There are a lot of postmortems going around, and I know we were not kind about the show. No. Ever. I, I, think, wonder... I feel like I've said all I wanted to say about Breakpoint. I know it's an already relatively small number of viewers watching that sh- that program. I wonder how many of those numbers were diminished because of folks like us who refused to watch season two because of that guy. Mm. The people they chose to follow, the, the, the way they chose to tell stories. Mm-hmm. We had Kyrgios in the first season, first episode even. You get uh, the point of comparison that we can make is that with full swing, you can follow what's going on in the golf. You get a, a sense of the stakes. Mm-hmm. You don't really get the sense of the stakes from the actual match play in Breakpoint. No, and, a, and really a poor understanding of how tennis matches even work. They showed, I mean, sometimes they showed like three points of a match. And it's just very difficult to follow for somebody who's not an expert. And for somebody who watches tennis, it's unsatisfying. So then you're relying on selling the show by selling the players. But how do you get a full understanding of who the players are when you can't see their playing styles? When you can't see and get a feel for the actual struggle that they went through during a match? You're just getting behind the scenes. Or just when they're not doing anything. Yeah. When Bedosa is injured. When Berrettini's slumping. Uh, the Ila Tomlanovich storyline was successful because of what she did at the U.S. Open against Serena. Right? It was compelling. To me, that was the single most compelling part of Breakpoint. Which I didn't expect. Mm. But uh, I've seen people say, I, oh, I, I think tennis players are just boring. <laughs> and I... I do understand that sentiment, but I disagree. I think they could have told the story in a much better... You just need better storytellers. Not all tennis players are boring. There's plenty of people who could have participated or plenty of stories they could have chosen to tell that they didn't. Did they have proper consultants in the filming of this thing to help them create these stories? Mm -hmm. Did they know what stories they should even be looking for? To the point where it just felt lazy that... Oh my God! Here, come, oh this curious guy. Yeah, this is this is the story. It just felt unimaginative. Yeah, and I also wish, and this is probably true of all of these sports docu series, these music quote unquote documentaries that we get of like what Lopez or who are the people? Ma- Everybody's making music documents. Sean Mendez. Everybody. They're boring because there's too much institutional meddling. The ATP and the WTA want to tell certain stories through the show. And it sounds like, as you know, I didn't watch season two, but it sounds like that's what a lot of the failures of season two sprung from. Anyway. It's a missed opportunity. It was. And it's not something that I'm celebrating. It actually really sucks because according to Nielsen ratings, Full Swing, which was the golf series, they actually found that 63% of viewers went on to watch a PGA tournament within two months of viewing Full Swing. That's the kind of crossover that tennis needed, right? And tennis needs to be easy to access and cool and fun to watch. You needed to put out a product that made people want to watch the actual sport. And Full Swing did that. And Drive to Survive is peerless in the way that they did that. They're in their sixth season on Netflix. And they have made Formula One big in north america where it was basically unheard of before we watched that netflix match of the century what was it called the netflix with rafa and carlos netflix Netflix slam Slam. and i recall definitely one maybe two mentions of breakpoint which Mm. it's the kind of perfect 
event to well, like, tether hello, to this show, right? It's a Netflix property as well. Why, why are but you not that, promoting at it? That, that, yeah. But at that time, it's been known to be canceled, probably. Yeah. Well, what is the point of doing that? It's, it's a travesty, really. <laughs> Speaking of travesties, <laughs> Andre Rublev came out with an interview with Sofia Tartakova on Wednesday of last week. He issued his statement slash non-apology on the Monday. Terrible. And I had heard people have been saying on Twitter, oh, something's coming on Wednesday. It'll be better. I don't know how these people knew that. It was better. Well, <laughs> if there is news about Mariah Carey coming, I will know well, more than sure. somebody who isn't a lamb. But Mariah Daly doesn't even exist anymore, which I have is a my real ma- tragedy. I have my ways and means. So I'm sure there are Rublev stands out there who... Right, who who know. Sofia Tartakova is a Russian TV personality. She has done a ton of work with Russian tennis players. And she is so, so good at what she does. She gets the absolute best out of these players. Like the rapport that she's able to build is unparalleled, at least in media that I've seen. Of course, she got the apology out of Andre. And I'm sure it was coached, right? I'm sure his people told him what he was supposed to say. But what we got was the apology that should have happened in the statement. He said most of the right things that you're looking for. It was 92.5% good. (laughs) Right. If I recall correctly, he does say something to the effect of there's no excuse for this kind of behavior, even if... The official is wrong. That was not needed. So close. We were so close. So close. Not needed at all. And again, we both like Andre quite a bit, but the apology sucked. His behavior sucked. But I'm glad to see it acknowledged. I just, I wonder why this stuff didn't make it into the original statement. A couple days ago, it was International Women's Day. And you know what that means. It means that we get our annual ATP video where a bunch of ATP players are asked, are there any women you look up to or who inspire you? Something to that effect. Previous editions of this, it was like 98.6%. My mom, my mom, mom. mama, mama, mama mia. My wife, my girlfriend, my sister. A lot of times it wasn't even wife or sister. (laughs) It was mom, 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 mom. And that's great. Like moms are amazing. I love my mom down, like, to the moon and back. But International Women's Day is aspiring to be more than recognizing your caretakers. There's also a Mother's Day. There is, indeed. But women should be seen as more than just people who care for and support and teach men how to be better men. Right, but this is what we've identified as one of the main problems with men on the ATP tour, right? Was and the how they're socialized. Of, the lack of imagination. That, but also just how infantilized they are. Well, and I think there's a because correlation. Because expects them to be better. Or right. And also yeah. I think there's a correlation between that and the parenting that they know exclusively in their early years of being socialized into the sport and then into adulthood. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, these people, sure, they've traveled and are cultured in that sense, but a lot of them don't know a whole lot about how the world works because of how insular their lives have been. So the women, they who are the women they know? The ones who have taken care of them. That's what I'm saying. Right? Who've made them better. So this year, once again, Grigor lets us know that it's his mother. We know, babe, Bradley Cooper, we know that you love your mom. (sighs) Francis says Viola Davis. Period. I lo- that was creative. That was out of the box. Because it's not just on them, right? Like, who's producing this stuff? <laughs> right. Because when what's, you're producing something, the question? don't the you, question? Give, you give prompts, right? You could say, who is a woman who inspires you? That's not your mother. <laughs> That's not your wife. If you had to point to one woman who you admire outside your family, who would that be? Mm-hmm. Do you know And then what- I, I, I guarantee you that people watching that back won't think, oh my God, Grigor hates his mother bad. No, like, no. how dare he they not mention his that. mother? Not one person would think that. Because Inst- again, this is not Mother's Day. Right. Instead, what we're left with is something that is just 
I, I, I can't even find a word that won't make me look like an asshole. <laughs> it, well, uh, it was slightly better this year, right? Well, yes. That's what your conclusion was? Yeah. Some of the answers passed the Bechdel test? They did. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Paul. Who does he love? Coco Goff. Exactly. Medvedev said Maria Sharapova. Carlos Alcaraz went on quite a bit about the Serena Williams. Those were the standouts. I think they were the only ones. Felix again mentioned his sister. And I'm his sure. Mother. I'm sure Felix's sister is awesome, and yeah. I'm sure his mother is lovely, mm-hmm. wonderful. You know what I'd love if one of them said, "Oh, Mary Shelley. You know what? She ate with Frankenstein." Emma Goldman. How about I love Jane Jacobs' urbanism. <laughs> Jane Austen. Wow. You know, if one of them said Joan of Arc with the Lord to guide her, <laughs> she was a sister who really cooked. <laughs> this is one of the best TV themes, theme songs ever, by the way. Maud, sung by Donny Hathaway. What about, I don't know, Miriam Makeba? And I probably said her name wrong, but like, guys, think out of the box. Women have done amazing things. Why we mock it is because it comes off as these men only seeing women's value as being in the home and as to nurture or and how, raise. How have these women supported and educated and benefited yeah. me? And it's not that sinister, but beyond the Women's Day videos and everything, you could probably think about some structural ways that ATP players and the institution itself could support women. Hmm. Aside from making a video, right? Not, they could have mm, they could have mm, joined the WTA in their boycott of China, say. They they could refrain from promoting accused and also convicted abusers. Yes. Also a women's issue. Yeah. They could I don't know, they could organize to institute new policies on maternal and parental leave. Uh all things that affect both women and men. Mm-hmm. Uh they could Voice support for equal prize? Oh, God forbid. I'm not even going to finish that sentence. No, James. Because we know. know you that know. That's not happening. That is a step. <laughs> How dare you? Because you know, even the most progressive heroes in ATB history, most of them were against it, including Arthur Ashe. It's Indian Wells time, which means it's Lawanda season. Yep. I hope Lawanda is getting free tickets. Getting paid somehow, in cash or kind. Mm, yeah. Because now she is a commodity. People want pictures with her. Tennis fans, not just the players, tennis fans want pictures with you. The, I, I tell you this, if she were Sheree Whitfield, she'd be out here making bank on those selfies. <laughs> $10 that? a pop. $10 and for- with inflation since then, it's up to 20 Oh, at least. Tennis Channel wants her. She's doing interviews there. I have seen some mm, cynical, un pleasant maybe lawanda fatigue stuff sometimes and i'm just like sure, but like i get it i L- mean lw is really really sweet like in person she's such a joy and she really is just there because she loves tennis like that's it she's created a niche for herself and Indeed. as people who I, I think it's safe to say we've created a niche for ourselves i hope so it's i, been I a can lot identify years. that even though it may seem frivolous that too takes a lot of work and dedication, mm-hmm. you know, to get to the point now where she has all these followers on Twitter for her to have a Lawanda season in effect. Like that is, I'm, I'm it saying. takes some, it takes some doing and it takes some non-sinister doing, you know, like this is not, it's not like, cynical. this is not yeah. maniacal. <laughs> you know? I hope she gets an agent and uh, monetizes this. Right. That's my, that's my take. Again, we're going to punt two stories to the next episode. The same <laughs> ones, actually. And I actually did the research this week. But it's gotten long, and we, we may need content for next week. But following this USTA story uh, where their lawyers are trying to prevent Pam Schreiber from testifying in a civil case about a player who was shown to have been sexually assaulted by a coach at a USTA training facility. That brings us to the end of episode 336. Thank you for listening. My name is Jonathan. You can find me on Twitter at tennis underscore John. And I'm James at Elliot JMR. Two L's, two T's, everything body serve related. 
can be found at linktree.com slash thebodyserve. We hope you are enjoying your bookmarks and postcards. If you haven't received it, it's in the mail. We are done with that process. If in a month or so you realize that you sent us an address and you haven't received one, let us know. We still got... It's just an accident. Yeah, we got supplies in abundance to be able to just pop that in the mail. We got a listener um, who showed us a picture of the stuff when it arrived. And she was able to get the contents without breaking the very special seal. Yeah, that's one of the new things this year is Mm -hmm. the, the envelope seal that you love. Also, one final thing. On the last episode, we read verbatim from a listener who opined on holding the WTA to account for Saudi dealings disproportionately to other men's sports. Do you mm-hmm. remember that? Mm-hmm. That was Sumit. He's given us permission to use his name, and so we want to give full credit there. All right. Thanks for listening. Till next time. Thank you very much.